we kick off into um, this, uh, this amazing prophecy, this amazing book. And uh, we studied the seven churches. We're on a little bit of a hinge point between the seven churches and then what we will look at, the seven seals. Uh, but in between the seven churches and the seven seals, we have these two glorious chapters. Revelation chapter 4, which we looked at in December. But now we come <clears throat> to Revelation chapter 5. We are in the throne room of heaven. John, in his vision, is taken into the throne room of heaven and we see the one who is seated on the throne. Revelation chapter 5. <clears throat> then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel <clears throat> proclaiming in a loud voice, <clears throat> who is worthy <clears throat> to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or to look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. That means that basically Jesus is all powerful and all seeing. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. We give thanks to God for his amazing word. You know, one of my favourite books is a book called The King's Gold, by, uh, written by a lady called Grace Turner. And uh, as part of Grace's pioneering ministry, there was a time when she was working with a team of people in church planting in a new estate. And one of the members of her team was a guy called Peter. And she writes in the book, a dream that Peter had one night. She writes this, Peter had gone to bed worrying about his marketing budget at work, but that night he had a dream. In his dream, the Lord came to him and said, Peter, what do you want? He replied, Lord, I want half a million pounds for our marketing budget. The Lord said, no, Peter, 
What do you really want? Not getting the hint, Peter replied, Lord, I really want half a million pounds for our marketing budget. The Lord said to him, what is more important to you? What is going on in the church or what is going on in your work? Without hesitation, Peter replied, the church. He was passionate about this this pioneering church planting project. He said, the church. He then found himself praying in an uncharacteristic way for the plumbers to pipe the love of God into the community, for electricians to bring light into dark places, for bulldozers to take down the walls of division, for drainage consultants to clear away the slurry of the devil's lies, and for us to fearlessly go where the needs are greatest. When he had finished, the Lord said, Now, Peter, what else do you want? He replied, I really do need half a million pounds for that marketing budget. The Lord replied, look in the yellow pages. Peter woke up the next morning chuckling at the absurdity of the last part of the dream. After all, who ever finds 500,000 pounds in the yellow pages? Uh, you might find J fishing or fly fishing by, by J.R. Hartley, but uh, not, not 500,000 pounds. When he went downstairs, a copy of the yellow pages was lying open on the table and he glanced casually at it, seeing <clears throat> an advertisement from one of his firm's competitors. How ridiculous, he thought. We never get anything from this type of advertising. And on a whim, he rang a colleague to ask if their firm advertised in the yellow pages, and if so, how much they spent. The reply came back, yes, we do advertise there and elsewhere nationally, and we don't get any work from these advertisements. Peter immediately stopped all unproductive advertisements and was in receipt of more than his request. It's amazing. <clears throat> you know, the encouragement of this passage is that however bad, however desperate, however bleak a situation may look, God always has a plan and God is in control. If, if in the next 20 minutes or so, you forget everything else that I share this morning, the one thing I really want you to take away is that God has a plan. God is in control. And although at times we may be confused, although at times we may not see our way through a situation, we may not see how we're going to solve a 500,000 pound deficit in our marketing budget, you may not be able to see around the corner of life. But the truth is God is in control and God has a plan. Look at the scroll. How does this truth relate to Revelation chapter 5? Well, we have to look at the scroll. Look at the scroll. Verse 1. Then in the right hand of him, I saw, uh, in, then, in, <clears throat> then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. In other words, God, the creator, the creator of everything, the creator of heaven and earth, the four living creatures represents all creation. God, the creator of everything, has a scroll in his right hand. And the image here is like one of an architect. He's like an architect with a rolled up design for a building. It's like the scroll is the architect's plan. Or you could say the scroll is like a general with a rolled up plan for a campaign. He's got a strategy. He's got a design. God has a plan. The scroll then here symbolizes God's plan for the world. But if you look closer at the scroll, it might be of good design, and it might be the best strategy you could ever, ever conceive of. But for the moment, it is sealed. For the moment, it is sealed with seven seals, 
and it is bound up. Now, in these coming months, we will see the reality of what these seals mean. <clears throat> we will see how the seals are seeking to thwart the creation of God's plans and seeking to destroy God's purposes. That, that's what's going on here. The scroll is God's plan. The seals are those things that the devil, what the enemy seeks to throw at God's plan in order to destroy it. In the throne room of heaven, as John saw this vision, he saw that it was like a battle going on. God's plan versus the kingdom of darkness. And at this moment, there is a lament. For the moment, there is a lament, and the lament is clear. Is there anybody out there who can open this scroll? Is there anybody out there who can unlock the plans and the purposes of God? And if you look in the drama of Revelation chapter 5, for a moment it seems <clears throat> that there is no one. There is a lament. In fact, the vision is so real that John is so moved by this that he begins to weep. I wept and I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. This is a desperate situation. It looks like the plan of God is lost. It looks like that the scroll will never be opened. It looks like the people are never going to see what's written inside. But then the moment comes. This is the moment of victory. This is the moment of the cross and the resurrection. Do not weep. The see the line of Judah. Do not weep. The line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. The weeping turns to joy. The mourning turns to gladness. There is one who is able to take hold of the scroll. There is one who is able to break open the seals. The Lion of Judah is able. The root of David has triumphed. And so what this drama is showing us very simply and very directly is that Jesus emerges as the one who is able to unlock and to fulfill the plans of God. Jesus <clears throat> is able. This is why the song is Jesus is worthy. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Think of Jesus as the fulfillment of God's plan. Jesus, Jesus himself declared it. Think about the scroll of Luke chapter 4, verses, verse 17. In Luke chapter 4, we read, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. It was handed to Jesus in the synagogue. And Jesus unrolled it, and he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then what Jesus did in that passage, having opened the scroll and read these verses from the prophet Isaiah, he then rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And then he said, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus says, I am the fulfillment of the prophecy. And now in Revelation, as this scroll is opened, Jesus is the fulfillment. Jesus is the one who is able to fulfill the plan. So helping us catch up, Ali, perhaps you could um, just show us this next slide. So just to summarize what I've shared thus far, trying to put it in simple, easy way to remember. The scroll is the plan of God. The seals are symbols of the things that are destroying the plan. We will look at those things that are seeking or the enemy is using to destroy the plan of God. But amazingly, the Lion of Judah is able to open the scroll 
and to destroy the seven seals. Look at the song in verse nine. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God. I want to, just in these last moments then, begin to ask the question, what do we see in the plan of God as the scroll begins to open? What do we see as Jesus takes hold of the scroll and breaks open the seals? What do we see in the plan of God? Quite simply, the most amazing thing is this. We are part of the plan. That's what we discover in Revelation chapter 5. We are not just spectators in the plan of God. Actually, we're participators. What's amazing about that is that, that just a moment ago, John is weeping because there is no one who can, there's nobody who can actually open the scroll. There's nobody worthy. In a way, we're not worthy to be part of the plan. In fact, actually, when we look at the scrolls, or sorry, when we look at the seals, we discover that we are part of the problem. We, we have been part of the destructive force of sin in this world. We're not worthy. And yet Jesus takes hold of the scroll and as he opens it, very clearly, we begin to discover amazingly that we are part of that plan, that God wants to use us in his purposes. So, so, so the question I want to ask is, we are part of the plan, but how? How are we part of God's redemptive purposes? Well, first of all, as we see here, we are part of the plan through our worship. Look at verse 8. The 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. It all gets a little bit cryptic at times and there has to be a little bit of guesswork when you come to Revelation. But, but the 24 elders, that number has been understood as the people of God. There were 12 tribes of Israel and then in the new covenant, Jesus uh, built the foundation of the new covenant of his blood with 12 disciples. And so you have the 12 tribes before Christ and then you have the 12 disciples chosen by Christ and together they symbolize the people of God. So, so the church, the people of God fell down before the lamb and each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense. We participate in the plan of God in these two ways. The harp is a symbol of worship. Basically, each one of us has a harp. You may not feel very musical today, but, but, but we can all offer the gift of worship. And worship is so much more than just singing, isn't it? it it's, it's being a living sacrifice. Jesus sets the tone. He is the lamb that was slain who is seated on the throne. Worship is sacrifice. It's an offering. As, as we sacrificially love people around us, as we go to the broken, the lost, the, the least, the, the, the anxious, the, the poor, as we, <clears throat> as we reach out in love, that is an act of worship. We participate in the redemptive purposes of God. We can be engaged in the battle against those things that would seek to thwart the plan of God through our worship. Our worship pushes back the kingdom of darkness. In the one hand, we have a, a harp, but in the other hand, we have this bowl of incense, which is the prayers. I don't think we've really fully grasped how important our prayers are within the plan of God. It's described here as a sweet aroma. It's like an incense, golden bowls full of incense. They are pleasing to God. And I'm not sure that I fully understand how it all works. 
But when the people of God fall on their knees and pray, when we pray into the injustices in our world, when we pray into the suffering of our world, when we pray into and, and intercede that the world would receive the good news of Jesus, something within the heart of God is moved by those prayers and the plan is put into action. I think that those two things, living that, living a life of worship where everything in our life glorifies God and, and in that act of worship, serving people in accordance with their needs, serving people with their needs and praying into the needs of the world, I think unrolls the scroll. We are part of the plan through our worship. We participate through prayer. Revelation chapter five is actually a call to prayer. So we are part of the plan through worship. But then secondly, developing this idea of a harp in our hands, we are part of the plan through service. Thank you, Ali. We are called to serve Jesus. It says here, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Do you know, you may not realize it, but each one of us here today, every single one of us has been ordained by God in the plan of God to be a priest. You're a priest. Have you realized that today? You have been anointed by the Holy Spirit for a priestly duty. You might want to tell the person next to you that, that they're a priest. You, you're a priest. That's incredible. It's always been the plan of God. Do you feel priestly today? It's always been part of the plan of God. In Exodus 19, verses 4 to 6, it says, Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And then in the New Testament, Peter takes hold of this and he says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. I love that. You can show others the goodness of God. And, and I think that's, as a priest, you're called to minister the things of God to the people of God. That's what a priest does. You minister the, th you minister the things of God to the people of God, and you take the, the offering of the people of God and you hand it to God. It's like, it's just ministering his grace. And it's really clear here that the original plan, it's not like the original plan was torn up and he had to come up with a new idea. We can see from Exodus that it was always part of the plan that God would use his people to mediate his goodness to the world, to mediate his goodness to the nations. The plan was wrecked by sin, wasn't it? But Jesus came to fulfill the plan. And now there's this reset. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. And so I think we've got this priestly duty. It's very clear that the scroll is unrolled as we seek to bless people around us with the grace of God. If you feed the hungry, if you clothe the naked, if you visit those in prison, if you bind up the brokenhearted, 
if you feed those who are hungry, if you show hospitality, if you offer the stranger a drink, all the time you do that stuff, God's plans are being fulfilled. All the times you reach out and minister the goodness of God to people, it pushes back the kingdom of darkness. And so, very simply, in conclusion, what we're seeing in this passage is that Jesus unlocks the plan, but we are part of the plan. Is that good? God, this is what we've learned today, basically. It's good to know that God has a plan, isn't it? In all the confusion of life, as I said to you earlier, you can forget everything else, but take hold of the fact that God is in control and God has a plan. What we see here in Revelation chapter 5 is that it was only Jesus who could unlock the plan. <coughs> And the question that I've asked this morning is, where do we fit into the plan? Well, we fit into the plan in these two ways. We fit in through our worship. When we pray, God's, God's kingdom advances. And we're also part of the plan through our service. When we minister the grace and love of God, the ki God's kingdom plan advances and so my encouragement from this amazing passage that we could only really scratch the surface of today my encouragement from this is at the beginning of the year why don't why don't we participate in the plans of God why don't we make a renewed commitment to prayer to worship and to service if we renew our commitment to prayer, to worship, to service, God's plans will be fulfilled. Amen? Let's pray together. Let's pray.